the interview right now. Good. Hey, my name is Matt Rozelle. We're at Hudson Falls High School. Today is January 23rd, 2009. It's the last day of our World War II class. Our seniors will be moving on to better courses in the springtime. And we're lucky, fortunate today because we have a veteran of the Second World War, a uh, Pacific Marine. His name is Herb L. Schuler. And I'll ask Herb some questions today. And uh, hopefully he'll tell us his story of World War II. Okay, so Herb, can you tell me uh, what, what day were you born? 6-6-24. Six, 6-6-1924? Six, 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 yes. A little 20 years, so you're 20 years old on D-Day. Well, I'm related to where I was <clears throat> on Pearl Harbor. I was in uh, Tampa, Florida living in a rooming house and eating at a boarding house with about 16 guys and I was taking a course <coughs> in Tampa U and surveying. And that became a very important part of this whole life story. I, uh, on on uh, the day of Pearl Harbor, after we ate breakfast, half of these guys disappeared. They all joined up. I was not ready to do that, I was, but the fellow who was giving, the gentleman who was giving the course in surveying at Tampa U was a dredging captain and he was mapping 600 acres between Tampa and Plant City for the person who owned the company, Captain Henry, who owned Henry Dredging Corporation. And he needed somebody to hold his rod and do his chaining uh, measuring and he asked if anybody wanted to do that and I quickly did that because I had no other source of income and I went to work for him. He picked me up in the morning, we went out, we mapped, we had a little crew where we actually had machetes and cut palm meadows for right -aways where we mapped this. It was a great experience and in the middle of this he got called on an assignment as a dredging captain. He says, Herb, can you take over? Now I'm just a kid. And I said, sure. And I took over the mapping of the 600 acres and met the owner because it was his property that he was developing in. He took a liking to me. He was almost a father figure at the time. And he liked me and he put me on one of his dredges at Key West and I also was on a tugboat taking that dredge up to Panama City. And it was that time that I either was going to have to get, stay with that company because these guys were exempt, they were doing government work, or join because I know I was going to be drafted at that point. And, and I just took the attitude that you're not going to draft me, I'm going to join. And if I'm going to join, I'm going to join the most active part of what I thought was the armed forces. And I joined the Marine Corps in Orlando, Florida. And uh, from Orlando, I went up to Paris Island for boot camp. Now you have to understand boot camp is where they change you from a citizen to a Marine. And it's done by beating you over the head practically. I mean, you, there's a couple of ways of doing things, but there's only one way the Marines will accept it. And you go in, you get your hair shaved, you get your clothes, you learn to make a bed that you can bounce a coin off and it better come up or it'll be ripped up again and you are physically challenged and all you do is learn to be a marine. You learn to take a rifle apart, put it back together blindfolded, you learn to march, you learn discipline, you learn to do what's told and when you clean up, you clean up, you either pick it up or if you can't pick it up, you paint it and uh, you really have a, an experience that's uh, a life-changing experience. I was in physical shape. You have to look at an old man here right now, but you can visualize somebody like yourself, uh, 18 years old, 135 pounds, ready to beat the world up. And I was really wanted to do that. I was, you were doing it because you were doing it for your country. It was very patriotic. There was no nonsense about who was with and who is what not. 
you were there and you did your job. And from uh, at, at Paris Island, by the way, they, they give you a, when you go in, they give you an aptitude test too. Now here I had this experience, and that's why I mentioned it, of surveying, and, and I uh, took this aptitude test, and the last week you're there, you do K KP, you do, you do duty of scrubbing down the mess hall, setting it up. You just do a week of nothing but kitchen work. And then at the end, they tell you where you're going. And I was ex very pleased. They sent me up to Camp Lejeune, to the engineering battalion, where I took a course on surveying. Now, you have to understand that I was a, really ahead of my little group of 15 guys because I was actually had done some and was very familiar. And consequently, uh, at the end of the course, which was given by a, a, a lieutenant who was an engineer, and he was given one sergeant's uh, appointment, two corporals, I think, and about four PFCs. And I was very conscientious, and I became a sergeant after that school was a specialty in surveying. And now you're a sergeant. Believe me, you can be a sergeant of any specialty you want, but you're a sergeant. And so you quickly pick up duties as a sergeant. I became sergeant of a platoon going through the engineering battalion. And every, I think it was six or eight weeks, I'd get a new platoon, and I'd get a new second lieutenant, a 90-day wonder that came out of Quantico. And, and uh, this was his first experience, and they assigned me a corporal. And that was done after every one of these sessions. And these sessions were marching from one specialty to another, demolition, heavy equipment, and all the parts of the engineering battalion had a week of training. So you went through that, and uh, but the real tricky part of this deal was discipline. You have to know that I marched these men every day to every meal, brought them out in the morning, inspected them. They shaved every morning. If they never shaved in their life, you shave every day. You learn to do things without questioning because you learned how to use a bayonet, you learn to use a rifle, and you learn to keep yourself in shape. And at that point, these new lieutenants coming down, they too were learning and getting into the story, and they would have a session with these, this platoon. And I remember this one lieutenant who came in, and these were all smart, bright guys. They just didn't have any experience other than being taught up at Quantico. And he taught them how to cross their rifles, which were M1s, and take a poncho and tie it around the bottom and take their helmet between the rifles and the ponchos for buoyancy. To get a little, if you can visualize, a little raft arrangement with two cross rifles, a helmet to hold on. And we did that one afternoon. And unbeknownst to anybody, he broke that tune out and we went for a march down to the river. Get to the river, we're going to cross this river with this lesson that this lieutenant had learned. And it was scary to me. I didn't know who could swim, who couldn't swim. And, and I remember telling these men that any of them couldn't go over that bridge and walk over. And a couple of them did. Anyway, the lieutenant went in first. And then and they made up their little Pontoons, pontoons, and we started across. The corporal went to the right flank, and I was bringing up the rear. I never got in the water. Halfway down, one guy yells, help, and the other guy yells, help. Before you know it, we lose a guy, drowned him in, in training. There's an inquiry. He died. Died, very much dead. And and you get, sh that was the first death I really experienced in service. It really, I remember it to this day exactly how it all happened. And there was an inquiry, and I remember these officers saying, now next time, put a rope up. And I said to myself, you know, it, it's, it's 
silly to lose people in training, but you lose them. And then the next platoon I took through, another lieutenant, but they all had to go through these sort of things. The last week of the training course, you have to understand, we went to each one of these heavy different divisions for four or five of them. This course was six to eight weeks. But the last week, we went out to the beach, bivouacking, and you built a fortification with sandbags and barbed wire. And then you took that platoon out, you brought it in, and attacked it and blew it up. That was the graduation. And I remember this also very clearly, that up on the ridge were all these dignitaries watching this trained platoon to come in and attack this little fortification. Well, one of the things you do is you take a demolition pack, which is nothing like a little knapsack with uh, explosives in it, and you build, you, you make yourself uh, with one of the square, I don't even know what the hell that was. It wasn't, they have a TNT, I don't know. But you put a starter and a, a cap in there, and then you have an actual fuse and then you have a lighter. The lighter is nothing more than something you pull that makes a spark. It hits the uh, fuse and the fuse goes down, burns and sets the cap off. And every one of those had to be inspected by a lieutenant before an officer before you could actually go through a, a, a training experience. Well, we did all of that and then we attacked and you go through as a fighting platoon with the ARs on the outside get these guys and blow up the barbed wire. And the culmination, of course, is you fire until you get to the thing, and, and the guy with the pack goes up, puts it on, and pulls it. Now, when you, you do that, you make sure that the fuse is a U shape, so if the spark goes out, it doesn't hit the cap. Well, we missed that procedure. Lieutenant didn't really look, he didn't have it tied, and we blew this guy up. And I can remember that just going up. We put him, sent him home in a bag, and that was another shocking thing that I visualized all the time. Anyway, that, that is some of the things that are done in training that you don't hear of. They're not heroes, but it's part of the hell of of becoming what you had to become. Well, from there, from Camp Lejeune, I joined the 4th Marine Division on Maui, went out to California, got onto a uh, boat in San Francisco uh, in the harbor there. We waited till we had a bunch of, of boats together, and then we went out to Maui. Now, again, as a sergeant, who was really a surveying sergeant. You had a platoon again. You sat there and you actually read the letters of anybody who wanted to mail anything for censorship. Why I was any better than anybody else, but there I was reading everybody's sad stories. And you were stacked up in this boat. You also sat sergeant of the guard duty uh, on the ship. And in Maui, I was assigned a platoon of reserves. Uh, I wasn't doing anything that I was trained at that school for, but being a sergeant, I was a drill instructor and I really had a good platoon. I had men there that I admired uh, and I was taking all the material given to me and I was a pretty good, I could, I could handle my job with great confidence and I enjoyed what I was doing at that time because un until you have to get into the blood and stuff, it's it's a big Boy Scout, it's a big big fun thing almost for you. It's not the tragic parts when you see people die. Anyway, we shipped out of camp uh, out of Maui for Iwo, and. Uh, I remember we left, I stood Sergeant Lagarde on Maui uh, for our uh, platoon, or our regiment, uh, and they let everybody out of the brig. It was Christmas, 
and if you weren't in there for some horrendous thing, you were left free. And so that Christmas and New Year's, these guys had a hell of a time. And then we boarded ships, and it was a month, thing, I guess, uh, that we were, we went to and landed in Maui. Now, the startling thing is getting a, on deck. You said you were, you left Maui. What year was this? Now is this forty-five? Yes, oh, about huh? Yes. Uh, Amazing. I have all these things down I'm doing it without looking at them. Um, I had a platoon of men that would kind of come in and reserve. And the first day, again, these are the things you remember. When you approached the island, came up in the morning, you got on deck. As far as you could see on the horizon, all the way around, were nothing but ships. It was like, it was like a fairy tale. I mean, you looked out there, and all there was as close, with no spaces between, ships, and all the, the armament on these battleships were were just laying it in. You could not visualize, or imagine how a little island like that could have anybody living in it, with the amount of firepower that came from those ships into uh, Iwo, and. The men would, you know, you, when you go onto a landing craft off a ship, you go down a net with your gear on. And the first day, I saw the guy get caught between the net and the, and the landing craft and get crushed. And we, that night, because I didn't go in till the next morning, the next day, we went to, we went out a ways. Something you want to remember to see a fellow Marine buried at sea in the taps and letting him go over the sides. Those things stay with you as, as the price to be there. And the next day, I went in with my platoon. Now, I had guys there that were really well trained, and I had taught them everything they taught me. And we went in, and when you hit the shore, it's a volcanic island with black sand that you sunk in as you came in. And we, we were to get in as far as we could go. Now, the first day from Mount Sarabachi to the highland up on the north, they had registered the whole beach with these large, large mortars, and they were just coming in. The guys got slaughtered that first day all through there. We came in and we pushed past the sand up and into, call them foxholes. There were holes that were done by ammunition, by, by mortars and, and that sort of thing. It was a mess just to get there. But we stayed there and I remember that night sleeping in what was a foxhole, scared as hell and thinking of all the things I didn't do all the things I wanted in life that I was not going to maybe not see. And I was very, very frightened. And I slept with that rifle next to me. At that time, I was carrying a carbine. And your whole life goes before you. It, it, it did for me, anyway, uh, at that moment. And right in the middle of all this thinking, and visualizing, and fantasizing, this recon comes up, a recon being a small truck with rockets, big, massive rockets, pulled up right behind me, not five feet from me, and let go a salvage of all of those. Now that's, that's not but a big blast and light and, and noise, and, and then they backed off and went away. And I just knew that was the end of me. They had me registered. The light was there. That's where the next thing was in. But it didn't. And I fell asleep finally. And when I woke up, we all moved up. And there was a guy with a clipboard who assigned the men for different areas. And there were officers they were assigned to when they were moving up. And this is why I told you about the survey. 
got to me. He says, Sergeant, there's a, a vacancy up at regimental headquarters for the artillery, because that's what I was trained to do, was to do, what we did was make a baseline and correct targets and the map from that baseline. And there I was. I can tell you, you have to be lucky. I was sent back there, and that's what I did, and I never got scratched. I was scared, and I lived through it, and I ate C K rations to begin with, which were like Cracker Jacks with hard tack in them, and C rations, which were cans, and I saw the smartest guys buried in some of the real dope-offs living. So you do the best, you try to best yourself, but there's, in war, you have to be lucky too. And I'll always remember the last day I was on E-World. I sat up on a high piece of land, looked down at the ceremony at the cemetery where heavy equipment had just plowed the field, laid these guys out, surveyed them out. There was a flagpole. They buried the dogs, these, these lovely, lovely animals around the flagpole. They were taking messages back from the forward observers back, as well as Navajos that we had that, that talked back. And that was something to see. We lost, I think I took down the number of that we lost on Iwo. We wanted to keep that number. It was 6,800 dead on this little island. Uh, the Japanese lost about 20,000. Now you imagine a little island here with 26, 26,000 people, 27,000 people giving up their lives. Think of nobody who could, went back and, and was loused up about it. But anyway, I went back ashore and the thing back up, back on ship. And let me tell you, to take a hot shower and have a hot meal and smell fresh bread, you think that uh, the world has come, come back to you. And from there, we went, I went back to Maui. The 4th Marine Division was sent home, but I didn't have enough uh, time in to be able to go back with the 4th because that was the only thing I had ever done. And they sent me to China. I went to Okinawa and then from Okinawa to China. And I was at Tsingtao, China, uh, cold as hell on the Yellow Sea. And uh, we, were, we were surveying the run, runways at the airfield in Tsingtao, China. Well, I had a marvelous experience at Tsingtao, China. Uh, one of the funny things, as we came into harbor, off that ship. Here I saw all these little people coming out to welcome us in these boats. And I said, isn't that fantastic? All these little boats were coming out to greet us. And as we got approached, these guys were doing nothing but following the ships, picking up the garbage. These people were really bad, bad, bad shape. Uh, we went to Tsingtao to, for the occupancy uh, because Japan had that, and we took, took over from the Japanese in, in that in that area. But I had a marvelous part in there and I want to make sure I have some time for you to ask questions. But I went back home. I, again, being a sergeant, you were assigned a bunch of guys, you took them by train, and I was discharged in Camp Lejeune, went home, and I met a young lady when I was on leave. I looked her up took her out, and at that time, because of the GI Bill, I went back to school, and on my first vacation, on my first uh, leave uh, break, Christmas break, uh, I got married. Married for 60-some years to this lovely woman, and we have three great young men. Uh, they're 50, 53, and 56, and uh, I'll tell you, I look back at it as done, having done a lot for me, uh, but it's funny, 
in my generation, I went to work from, by the way, my wife became pregnant in my second year and I had to go to work. I had to go to work. I decided to go to work. And I went to work for one firm and worked for them until I retired at 71 and, were, and sent three boys through college and had a second home in Columbia County and now I'm retired in a marvelous, marvelous retirement community at the Glen uh, at uh, the Meadows up high the Meadows. So I've been blessed and I've had a marvelous life. But I want to tell you, you people, every generation is different. You're going to have another, you've got some big problems. But one of the things I hope you do is try to prevent war because it's hell. That's my story. Well, we have some questions for you, too. Yeah. Now, were you from Glens Falls originally? No, I uh, I was born and reared in Newark, New Jersey. I brought my uh, when I worked, I uh, when I could afford it, I bought a home in Livingston, New Jersey, a suburb of Newark, Newark. And uh, when I further succeeded, I bought a farm in Chatham, New York. We did that because we were campers and we went north and camped. But one day, my wife said. You're not going to get me in a tent again. And I went and I rented a f little farmhouse for a vacation. We liked it. So I looked and we bought a farm. Six, we bought a 100-acre farm in Columbia County. And uh, we used it weekends and holidays until I retired. I retired there and it got a little too much for us. We moved up here. From Chatham up to Glens Falls? Yes, we were supposed to, we were using our uh, Albany Med for our medical, and we were supposed to go to Niskuna. The Glen, Glen Eddy uh, has Eddie has a place in Niskuna, but when we got to do that, uh, there was no room, and they suggested coming here, and it was a great move. We're here about three and a half, almost four years. Uh, we love it up here. We love the whole area, and uh, what I can see of you and people, we even love all of you, young people. There. Group. They uh, were eager to come over and talk to you. So, do we have some questions for our Pacific Marine, Andrea? Um, after you like got discharged and stuff, what did you? I can hear you. After you were not in the military anymore, what was your job? Like, okay. What did you go on for your further profession? Uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, I was going to a college of engineering, and on the board there was this job that in climate control company who uh, was actually a uh, contractor uh, and distributor of Chrysler air temp heating and air conditioning equipment. I went to work for a gentleman who was calling on architects and so I started calling on architects. I then became a salesman and then I became uh, a sales manager for the heating and cooling part of that business and then I became a vice president. Finally, I ran the operation as senior vice president. It's a hard thing. Young people don't have those opportunity. I guess because I, each one of my kids have had well, more than one or two different careers, and it seems to be the logical thing. But I don't know. I just had a wonderful, loved my work, and, uh, and that's another thing. Uh, if I can leave, I would suggest that you find something you love when you decide to go to work. But until then, get all the education you can. Did you go to college? I had two years of college. GI Bill help? GI Bill did it. In so fact, what the, was the GI Bill, just to explain? It, the, when we got out of service, there were lots of things available to us as veterans. And one, of course, was the GI Bill of Rights that paid our tuition uh, while we went to school. And I got married at my first break and uh, my wife was working and uh, but it, it, it got me there. I don't know if I would have gotten there without it. In fact, the funny part of that was you also got, and I think it was in the back of this that there might have been a little notation printed on there, uh, that they, you had a number that permitted you to uh, we needed a bedroom set. 
and to get a bedroom set those days there wasn't much wood you went to a furniture store and if you had a certificate uh, the guys were very happy to sell you because they could get replacement for it because they sold it to a GI. Oh. I never heard that before. That's, I think one of our kids is still sleeping in that bed. <laughs> Good stuff. Did you have something? Yeah, do you, do you still keep in touch with anyone that, um, like anyone that you fought with or that you were well, with? I'll tell you, and I may be in the minority of this, because someone once asked me that before. I, until speaking with you, uh, I've never told my story. I never joined a veterans organization. I never fought the war. I never went drinking with the guys. And uh, it was something that, uh, I'll tell you something. What I'm telling you, you ought to go back if, if you have any grandparents and get to talk to them because I've never talked to my kids about the war. I never talked to my father about his experiences. You have a tendency not to get into that with them. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great thing to do. I, I always regret the fact that I didn't have that smarts to do that with my father because he would have let me know. But I didn't. I didn't. I, I really didn't. The only thing I ever did close is I took one of my my uniforms and gave it to one of my grandchildren to use for Halloween. That's as close <laughs> as I got to doing anything. That's not that's not that uncommon, though, from what I find. And I, I find it's actually. Um, I never talked to my father. He was a Korean War vet. Here now, you have over a hundred World War II veteran interviews. Yeah, I never even talked to my own father about it. Yeah, and um, I think it's really important that people like you do have a chance to share your experiences with these people. And my generation, we never, thank God, had to go to war. And I'm really glad you I came hope, in. I hope you people can avoid that as well. Uh, as you know, I had an opportunity to do this interview at the Glen and they have an audience of peers there of people and uh, I said to the person who was organizing this uh, says I would do it for young people for students but I have no desire to tell my story to a bunch of old people like me and I hope you enjoyed or got something from it yeah I still have some more questions. Do we have more questions here? I also want to thank Mark. He he did a terrific job, and I was so proud to be there to listen to him because he handled himself so well. I heard of some people who didn't get to talk to you, uh, but I was so pleased to give that time. Mark came to the cottage, and uh, we had a little time together, and uh, I think you did a great job, Mark. How long were you on Iwo Jima? Were you there for the whole battle? Yes, yes. Well, you know, I was, I was parked uh, for the first day there, right before the the air, airport, the runway, got in about there, and then I went to Regimental, which was also at the end, other end of the runway. The battle itself was up to Surabachi, where they put up the the flag. And, Nothing but caves all the way up. And you so you saw the flamethrowers and you, you heard the the noise. They were dug in, they could stay there for, and the, the guys just kept on going. It's, it, it's it's altogether different than the wars that are being played today. It doesn't resemble anything like that. But uh, I was there it was only a month mm -hmm. the whole business. It was a long month, though. Yes, yes it was. And, uh, and as I say, other than the shock of seeing guys in those training times and the guys on the beach and seeing the cemetery, 
The rest of the time was was great. If you go, to, if you can join the service and they guarantee you don't have to shoot or go to war, it's a hell of a good experience. They don't guarantee that. No. Did you see the flag? Do you remember the flag raising or anything? I don't remember the raising, but I remember the flag. I mean, I, it, it, it took place not ceremonially, as far as I was concerned. I was pretty close. I was, uh, I was closer to to Sarabachi than I was to the other end of the island. That's what we're looking at here. That's Sarabachi. This is Sarabachi. Yeah. Here. We came in over here. This was all high. And that's where they have all the underground uh, material. Tunnels and tunnels and caves. Uh, and the airfields from here. I one of the things you, you saw flying back and forth over the island with these little planes, our little uh, one-wing, one-motor spotters that went back and forth looking for for uh, things, uh, targets. And, uh, but uh, I was lucky. And I was lucky because I did that survey down in Tampa and I always think it's, that's what saved me and that's what gave me this opportunity. So you had the skill to really put you behind the scenes to orchestrate the fire. The, the, the fact that I had the survey got me to survey school, the fact that I had the little edge on people got me a sergeant's rank right? and from that point on I, I had a, a, an experience that was I think stood me well in my career for the rest of my life. I learned how to handle people. I came back matured. You know, one of the things you do in service, I don't know if other people did, but I thought a great deal about what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to, I started to evaluate what was real and what wasn't real, what was, what, it, what was worth doing, and I came home knowing that I wanted to be part of a community. I wanted to be part of a family. I, I just thought those were the worthwhile things in life. And that's why I guess I married when I did quite early after I got back. Uh, I, I was careful to, to know I found somebody that was a good kisser uh, and a great warm person and a, and a person who had my values. And uh, we were very fortunate. We, raised three great kids, and I'm proud of where I've been, and I'm just thankful and so happy that I, I, I'm really lucky because I'm living a lifestyle, you know, you know, you know, worthwhile type of life where I go to concerts, go to, to Hyde, go down to Saratoga, to, to SPAC, uh, go to Lake George. This is a great country. I'm fortunate enough that uh, I can partake of that. So your service obviously was a turning point for you as a young person. It was certainly, it certainly marks who I am. That generation of people who went through service, their life coming out of it was marked and, and, and was uh, directed from there, I'm sure. A lot of people go in different directions. You go to these. I, I'm very, very I've, I've always been part of Trout Unlimited since I've been up here, and, and some of the meetings are at some of the veterans' places. And, and guys, and, and I, I'm a Scotch drinker, and I like to have a drink socially. But you see people who have spent the veterans who have, who have gathered together around bars to fight the war uh, that had been scarred and been, it became the thing, the dominant part of their lives. It's, it's a very difficult thing for me to uh, see. And yet uh, people of my age who have been very, very successful have come out of the same experience. So you can be what you can be and you can be whatever you want. Choose your friends. Give it hell, do the best you can, and you'll come on top. I always felt, and I always told my my boys, that the majority of people, majority of people, 
do not meet their capacity because they, they don't put that little extra. They, they go and put their four hours in or their eight hours in. If you do that little extra, if you find something you can like and, and enjoy, so you can give it that extra, you'll go to the top because most of the people are just there spending their time. That's pretty philosophical. Well, if you looked around, that's what you see amongst your peers, too, I think. Now, what was it like, if you don't mind me going back and asking sure. a few more questions? Sure. Um, we don't hear much about the China Marines. Like, what did you actually do when you were in China? What was it? You were, why were you there? Okay, we were there taking the, the, the we were occupying, the, Japan had occupied that area, and we were taking over from the Japanese. The war was over, the Japanese uh, were, were there. The, uh, I was there, what I was asked to do, I joined the, I was with the Seabees actually. I, uh, they took me because I was serving, I went up and were putting stakes into the runway of enlarging the airfield in Tsingtao, China. And it, one of the cute things was we, we had a little mascot, a little Chinese kid, may have been nine, ten years old, he'd meet us at the gate and we'd take him with us and take him into Chow and, and of course his parents I think were just waiting for him to come home every night so we always gave him some food to get back and that's what I was doing. But while I was doing there, I used to go to services every Friday night and I'm Jewish and I'm not religious. One of the things that you find in the churches, synagogues, you find language and things spoken that are very comforting rather than four-letter words that you will find at the, at the bar, although I drank beer with the guys all the time. So I would do that, and when I was in Tsingtao, China, there was a community of Russians that came down from Harbin and they had a little community in there. They were actually treated as a community by the Japanese. And I, they were going to build a little synagogue. And I built, in the, in the Orthodox religion, they build a little platform and they separate the women from the men. And they have an ark. Well, being I was in the Seabees, I had access to these guys. These fellows who were not Jewish at the shop built me whatever I wanted. And I spent my days with a saw and a hammer building this little interior. And I used to remember they used to come around and never saw a young boy carpenter working. I was no carpenter, I was just handy. My dad was a builder, so I had to have some tools. And it was just a great experience because I was with civilians and we would go out to eat. We'll put our fellows in barracks with money in, into a pot. We'd go and sit around and have a great feast with a ser someone serving each of us around the hall. But that's what I was there. I was there serving at the airfield, and I had a great experience with the civilian population as well. How long were you there for? Not too long. I think I might have been there, and I can't tell you for sure, but I would think I was in Sing Tao. I was there one New Year's, came back. I would say about five, six months, maybe five, six months, something like that at the time. Did you ever run across any Japanese? I mean either on Iwo Jima or POWs or in China? I mean, afterwards? During? Before? I mean, well, during the battle on the island. Oh, no, 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 I could, you saw fire, but I never saw, I never did that, I never did, uh, never saw a live one. <laughs> what about in China after the war? Were they gone? Yes, yes, for me, yes, they were. I don't even remember any fighting at all. Not at all. It was patrolling, uh, that sort of thing. One of the things I remember very clearly in Tsingtao is coming out of the mess hall. And there was a, a, 
a corridor that you came out of, of wire, as you went out of the mess hall. And there were these 55 gallon cans of soap, rinse water, that you would take your gear, clean it, go down the line. And on each side of you, there were these Chinese young people begging for food that you shouldn't put into the garbage pail. I mean, these people were poor, poor, poor. You know, they didn't have enough to eat. What about the communists? Do you see any well, tension this, between these, the nationalists and the communists? This, this was, these were na nation, nationalists. They were nationalists, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. This was the Gomendam. Chiang Kai-shek. Right, right, that's who this, this was being turned. Don't know of anything political. I myself was not aware of any pol That was furthest from my mind was what was going on politically there. I wanted to, I didn't have any of those involvements at all. Did you make it to Japan at all in your travels? Not in service, but it was funny. Um, I was very successful in this company that I joined. As a salesman, I was a pretty good salesman, became sales manager. They had these incentive programs, and uh, one of them was to Japan. We went to Japan. I went for Japan for two weeks. I went for a week with the company, a week on my own. And I didn't know how I would feel about that, facing people that you knew were enemies. And I'll tell you, I came back with admiration of the culture, the way I was treated, what I saw. It, it was the most marvelous trip I think I had taken with my wife um, and we went all the way down uh, went to Kyoto we went down to the very end of the islands we had a marvelous marvelous trip and everywhere I went I was comfortable and uh, I had a really good admiration to this day I love Chinese Japanese food <laughs> Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was wondering, the one thing that stuck out in my mind, the men that surrounded you when you arrived at Iwo Jima, what uh, was really, you know, the, the feeling of the troops? Did they have uh, an idea of how important it would be as far as the battle they were about to fight? Or did you have that kind of respect for the Japanese culture and were, was everybody prepared for the I don't think. The I don't team? think that, you know, you're... You're trained to do what you're to do, and you don't really weigh it upon, I didn't anyway, and I didn't see anything, I wasn't aware of anything, of, of other than, you, you know, if, if somebody gives you a bayonet, you run a course, and somebody keeps shouting, make it louder, and he tells you how to use that bayonet, and, and, and how to scream at that, that pole. And, and you, you do it over and over, and you're trained to shoot, and you're trained, disciplined to do what you're told to do. Uh, you go in not liking who's out there, and you, you're, you're ready to, you're, you're just going to get them before they get you, and, uh, and you were doing it very patriotically. We, we, we had a cause, and we were going to do it. We knew about Pearl Harbor, and we knew about the guys that were coming back. We'd tell you stories, too. We had heard stories of, of how other people. So, But you weren't all jazzed up about those feelings. You were jazzed up about going in and doing what you were trained to do. And you were trained. I, you know, I, I, I was, I'll tell you this. They did a hell of a job of training. You know, I think they, they take a civilian and make make a little war machine out of you very quickly. And when you hear of things that guys do, and you, how could they ever do it? You'd be surprised how you can be trained to do. You can be trained, you can be, you can brain, brainwash pretty good uh, in terms of doing your job uh, training-wise. I wish all of you never have that experience. 
just travel, have a healthy, wealthy, and lovely family life. Not a big place. No. Eight square miles, right? You don't see any any trees or anything, you just see you saw black sand. Black sand. But you guys came in right through here, I guess, huh? Right here. Right here. And you know you're organized too. You're told what beaches you're on. My group, I forget which beach, but there's a colored Beach, you, you, they actually had flags that you could identify as you came of what beach you were coming up on. Did you see the sand? Mm. We passed around that volcanic oh, did you? ash. I have a cousin who was in the Marine Corps and he got to go to Iwo Jima. Yeah. And that's taken from Red Beach too, I think. That's it looks familiar, huh? Yes. There's not much there today. I guess it's a Japanese air base. Well, you know, this uh, Iwo was, I think I was reading, was the first actual, actual uh, island that was really Japanese. I mean, that we really thought of as being part of, of Japan. I'm going to look here and see if, I, if there's anything here that I wanted to tell you. That, and I think I covered pretty much what I wanted to tell you. You never went back, obviously. Never went back. Never went. Oh, shouldn't say that. One of these promotional trips the corporation had was to Hawaii. Uh, you went and to Hawaii. we went to Oahu. And we got on a plane and flew to Maui, and I wanted to find the camp. Uh -huh. And we drove around that place. Nobody never heard of the Marine Corps. I couldn't find anybody. I could never find our camp. Because really? <laughs> uh, Ralph Lena was talking about a similar experience when he was in Maui, going back to Maui. No, I couldn't uh, do that. Uh, but that's a great shot. You see the sand on the beach there, yeah, yeah. and the traction, yeah. trying to get the traction in the soil. Well, when we came in, there was debris all through us, the vehicles and everything else was a mess. Yes, it was shelled pretty badly, or 74 straight days, I guess. Oh, you, you know, it's unbelievable, unbelievable that, that the amount of, of shells that were flipped in there from, from battleships. Just, you couldn't imagine to be anything living on that island, but they were dug in in these caves, and they had that whole beach registered. So when you, they came in, those boys, that, that first day, they slaughtered a lot of people. They certainly did. Mr. McTagg, was your grandfather in the vicinity in his cruiser and around Iwo Jima, you know? I do not believe it was huge. But, uh, like you mentioned before, he doesn't like to talk about it it's pretty much at all. Yeah. Why I know very little about his experience. It wasn't very good when the ship went down, so he never uh, talked about it. So. I can tell you that of the three years I was in the Marine Corps, almost half of them, a good part of it was at sea. And being a sergeant, I would stood sergeant of the guard duty on aboard ship quite a few times. And I'll remember the time that I was sitting, you, you, you're, you're sailing, no lights, it's dark. And uh, I heard I was called sergeant of the guard to the bridge, and I get up to the bridge, one of the guys at one of the turrets stepped off the wrong way, went into the drink. So a lot of things happen aboard those ships too. A lot of, you know, you, you, you try to talk about people doing a lot of things in close, close quarters, lots of things happen. 
Um, so, did you recover the guy that fell off? No. Or you just kept going, right? Well, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's we do. were in convoy. Right. You don't stop. Do you remember where you were when the war ended? I really know. How about the bomb? Do you remember when you heard about the atomic yes, bomb? Yes, I, I remember the, the, that. I was on, uh, at Maui. The, uh, the other interesting thing that happened when we got back from Maui, got back from Iwo to Maui, they gave us R&R &R on, on Oahu. And I had a week at the Royal Hawaiian right on Waikiki Beach. With, Diamond right there. That was real good duty for a week. And, but what you learned there was how sweet those people, the civilians were. The Hawaiians uh, were just lovely, lovely people. And they couldn't do enough for us at that particular time. I mean, I felt that way anyway. Besides the beach, just going into a, a bar and sitting there having dried shrimp just piled up in there. And, it, and everybody being very pleasant. It, that was a well, again, you're, you're so relieved to get out of the routine that it was a, a wonderful experience. Did you ever get to Pearl Harbor when you were in Oahu? Uh, Do you remember? No, I, you know, we went there on R&R &R that right. we could see, but I didn't get into doing any visiting. I just saw it. Uh, when we were in Hawaii, Oahu was a wonderful island. We were there on this trip with uh, Chrysler Corporation, who was our supplier, and we visited all around that island, and it was a beautiful island. The only fu other funny thing I can tell you about that is while I was, you know, you never tell your folks, you couldn't tell your folks where you were. And the, I was in Hawaii, a Maui, and the first care package I had, my sister sent me a can of pineapple. <laughs> I thought that was funny. You didn't need it. No. They didn't know where you were, though, right? No. no. And the other thing was the great, uh, what was the email, I guess. Well, what did they call it? V-mail? V-mail. They were mail. about this big and a little bigger. And uh, they photostatted those and, and sent them around. That was fun in the sense that you got that. It was something, that, some communication that you could get back. Which one's Maui? Well, this is this is Hawaii itself, the Big Island. That that uh, had uh, Maui must be right in here, I think. Yeah, I think so. I'm not sure, but I think so. No, try it again. Get it closer. Maybe we'll try it all. Honolulu. That's there's always oh, this. Oh, oh. Try those. Oh, try that other one. Try this one. What is this? What is it? This, this is Maui. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Japanese came in here, bought up a lot of.